Okay, thanks. All right, we're gonna give, I'm gonna give All maybe, right. oh, I hear an echo. If those who are not the co-hosts can mute, that is excellent um, for the time being. Um, I'm gonna give like 30 seconds as people trickle in, but hopefully we can get started as close to two as possible. Um, Thank you. Um, I think that was our, our Zephyr point of contact. Elizabeth helped us mute everybody. Um, <clears throat> all right. So I think people might still be coming in as we talk, but that's okay. Um, I'm going to get started since we have several people joined already. Um, thank you for joining this learning session about data workflow tools and tricks. Um, if anybody can't hear me or anything, please type in the chat. Not that you'd be able to hear me say that. Hopefully people will get the point. Um, thanks for joining this learning session about data workflow tools and tricks brought to you by the Zephyr Foundation. Um, and for those who aren't familiar with Zephyr, um, it's a nonprofit that supports research and collaboration across the transportation data modeling and forecasting industry. Um, includes academia, agencies, and other practitioners. So if you are interested, please check out their website um, if you'd like to learn more or become more involved. Um, I am Leah Flake. I'm a data scientist at RSG, <coughs> and I am excited to be moder moder moderating this panel for you. Um, so today we're going to be learning from three experienced data science, data science professionals about how they approach setting up and leveraging data workflows for their projects. Uh, They'll share what they're working on and how their workflows affect collaboration, testing, repeatability, and more while they're wrangling, visualizing, and otherwise evaluating data and model outputs. Um, so the goal from the session is that you, the audience, will come away with new ideas about how to approach your own data work, um, whether that's a new tool, a best practice, or another bit of advice from our speakers or from each other if you're um, interacting in the chat. So this is a learn and, and discuss session. Um, after each person speaks, uh, we'll give time for maybe one question and then we'll have time for discussion at the end among all of the speakers and the audience. So please feel free to use the chat to ask clarification questions, to start a discussion, to ask a question to the speaker. Uh, we'll also have the speakers interacting in the chat as well, so hopefully it'll be a, a nice dynamic session with a good discussion. Um, before we get started, I do want for our speakers to get a sense of where we are in the audience, what the experience levels are. So I'm going to ask a poll. Um, I think we still have, okay, we've got about like 60 people joined. So I'm going to ask a poll and if you can take a few seconds to answer this poll, um, which of the following statements describe you and then we'll see where everybody is and just answer as best you can. And if none of those work, there's a not an option. It's not like the pinnacle of survey design here, but hopefully gets to the point. Um, seeing things converge around, most people have some experience with um, either some experience or a lot of experience with data. So that's great. Okay, it looks like, okay. Five more seconds to answer. Five, four, three, two. Okay. Um, <laughs> option two, one. Uh, but that, that's good to know. So uh, Suzanne, Ann, and Billy can kind of calibrate their discussion around the mid level, which is probably about where we were aiming anyway. And those of you who have more experience, you might have points to add to the chat if you know something else that um, isn't that we're not covering yet, or you have advice for. The audience. The other question I want to ask, um, there's been a little bit of interest in using version control tools in the Zephyr community um, is what I've heard. So, and I think some of our speakers might reference different version control tools. So I want to ask a poll also about 
how much and which types of version control you, the audience, have used. If you can take another minute to answer this question, thank you for bearing with me through these polls. Um, I know these aren't totally mutually exclusive. If you've got another tool to add, feel free to pop it in the chat or something. Um, Okay, so it's, it, there's a mix, it looks like, of people who haven't really used version control technology. And if, if you're not familiar with the terminology, um, that's if you've heard of Git, that's version control. It's a way of both collaboration and storing code and being able to kind of uh, track changes in your code. I'm probably not describing it very well, but one of our speakers might be able to do a, a good job with that. Um, but that's good to know. So a lot of people have used Git, a couple of people have used uh, Subversion, which is a different version control technology from Git, um, some with a different version control tool, and about a third of people haven't really used version control very much, and maybe you'll find that it's a good tool for you in, in listening to the speakers. Okay, I'm going to end the poll. Now, um, all right, so, oh, I can share results. Um, sorry, I didn't share results from the first one, but I think our co-hosts can, can see the results so they'll know how to target their talks. Um, all right, so let's hear from our speakers. And as each speaker talks, I'm gonna ask the subsequent speaker to monitor the chat in case anybody has burning questions or needs clarification on something, um, we can make sure to ask those at the end or if it's really important, um, we can interject or something, but try to let the speaker keep speaking. Um, and then after each speaker is done, they that person can join into the chat and um, answer questions while they're not presenting. Um, all right, so I'm gonna close the poll. Um, and hand it over to Suzanne. So Suzanne Childress is a data scientist at Puget Sound Regional Council, and she leads the data science team there. She holds a bachelor's degree in mathematics from Carleton College and a master's degree in industrial engineering from Northwestern University. Suzanne used to do travel modeling in Denver and Seattle, but has shifted to working more broadly with urban planning data. She loves discovering human behavior for planning using st statistics and getting lost in code for hours. So Suzanne, I think you can share your screen and unmute yourself and we'll get started. Oops. Can you see my screen now? Yep. Yeah. Oh, okay. You, you're muted, Leah. Okay. You can see it. Though. Okay. All right. So um, like Leah was saying, my name is Suzanne Childress. I mean, uh, manage the data science team, which is just like a little subgroup in the data team at uh, Puget Sound Regional Council, which is the MPO in Seattle. And I used to do travel modeling. And like I was like uh, Leah was saying, and now I'm kind of do more generalizing out. I feel like there's more that I can do for the planning community by doing a broader range of things. Um, so I'm going to show you some examples of uh, um, some good data workflows with through the example of working with a household travel survey data. Um, one thing I'd say about this topic is I'm not necessarily that passionate about it. It's more like how you're passionate about your plumbing and your electricity, like you, you need it to work. <laughs> and it's what I talk about it and do it all the time. So um, Hopefully Billy and Anne will have a little more a little more passion behind the subject. Also, the other thing I would say about it is Elizabeth Saul mentioned saying like a healthy debate, having a healthy debate and banter about about some of these tools. But I think what I'm saying here is just all like 100% scientifically factually true. And so I don't think there can really <laughs> anyway. I, I would like to hear someone debate what I'm saying because I think it's just right. It's like it's like climate change. We know we know this is right. So I'm going to show you this example of um, what I'm talking about with workflow with travel survey data. So it's the when you have travel survey data, as probably most people know, it looks like a lot of like raw records with a bunch of numbers and it's highly detailed. It might be dirty. And but then you want to turn it into something meaningful for the planning community. So here's an example. Here we got these raw records. And then we want to turn it into a data analysis. 
So I'm not going to talk about how you chose to do this particular, we chose to do this particular analysis that shows that home deliveries increased from 2017 to 2019, which I think is an interesting topic, but I don't think that's what people want to hear about today. I think they want to hear about how we did the workflow. Um, but how, what are the steps that we went, we did to go between those two, this, you know, really raw data to something output. I'm not, I'm not really going to talk about the visualization either. It's just, how did you get in between those? But then also, how did we get from that raw data to uh, this cool app that we did, we designed that takes, takes the raw records and, and helps planners understand the data um, and visualize it. So this particular, the app that we built in our shiny app, and it lets, it lets planners uh, interrogate the data, um, expand it, put margins of error on it. And, but obviously there's a lot of like, things that are going on in the background that helps the, helps the data get munged over into that shape. And then another example of travel survey workflow is going from that raw data again and over into an estimated model. So like the actual estimated model part isn't really doing the like thinking about how, what you want your model to do. That's not really the workflow part. It's like more like how do you nuts and bolts get that data into the right format so you can do this, this actual work. So all those steps are workflow. And as I was kind of thinking about giving this presentation, I was finding some people talking about this like 80-20 rule of data analysis, which is like 80% of the time you're getting the data ready to work with it. And then 20% of the time you're doing your actual, like actual work with the data. Um, and maybe that should be different. Like hopefully like if you had some really efficient tools, you could actually be doing the thinking part more, which is what I'm always hoping to do. But I, maybe that's not realistic nowadays. So, and then there's also some people just, that's 100% of them, what they do is workflow. You know, like we, like a, our database manager, we have a database manager and that's probably what he, if he's here, is that, that's what he does 100% of the time. Um, I think it's really important that we are talking about it today though, because we never talk about it. Like if we give a presentation at a conference, we don't talk about it. We talk about the beginning part, which is like, how did we design our model? And then the end part, well, here are all my results. But we don't talk about what we did, which is kind of a shame because we probably could be doing things a lot more efficiently and better if we were actually focusing on how we did things. Um, I'm going to talk kind of pretty basically today as well, because I wasn't sure. It looks like people have a little more experience than I, what I was imagining. Um, so this might be kind of basic, but maybe that's good for the first presentation. Um, I kind of see this as our craft, like it's like how we do things, how we make something work. And then I think my top two philosophies with it is you need to be able to replicate what you do and you're going to make mistakes. I mean, I make a ton of mistakes, so you need to plan around those mistakes. So the three kind of philosophies that I'm going to talk about today are scripting your workflow, communicating it, and testing it. So I'm, I'm going to just talk really generally and really fast about each of these topics. So my first set of things is about scripting. So the first step in the scripting when you have travel survey data is that you need to check and clean your data and that checking and that cleaning should be scripted. Uh, if you can't script it, you should at least build a tool that helps you record what you manually did. And then the second thing about scripting everything, like I think there's a tendency to script part of it and then it's too hard and you decide to go do something in Excel. Um, that is a bad idea. You want to script every single part of it. And then you want to make your script readable. So maybe it's a little self-explanatory to use functions, but I think it just bears reminding when you start doing something over and over again, you need to write a function for it. And then your script, you need to put it in a shared place. I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to be GitHub, but it needs to be in a shared location. So here's some examples with travel survey scripts. This is stolen from Billy Charlin, who's going to talk in a little bit. So, um, Here's some travel survey data, and this data has not been cleaned yet. And you can see that they had these people who are starting at home, and then, and then they just have a trip where they said they went from home to home. They don't really understand what the trip is, so they entered this thing home to home. 
So like with this case, it's pretty easy for you to kind of, you could do some kind of regex thing or whatever and just see if the place start is home and the place end has home in it. If both of them have home, you need to delete that record. So that's a pretty kind of straightforward case. And then the, the one below is the same, the same deal where there's somebody who's like, I went home and then they're home. They don't really understand what a trip is, which is understandable because our surveys are kind of really difficult to take. Um, sometimes you just can't really script it and you got to manually go through and find these cases. But that's the thing where I was saying you need to have a tool that helps you record how you made these choices and classify it. So here's an example of a script that we wrote for data cleaning. Um, and we called it Rulesy because we really like cutesy names for things. And it's just a set of rules. So just logical rules that we've determined make sense from travel survey data. We've seen over the years, these patterns arrive, arise. So this one, it's an example of where you have, um, you have one person who's missing the trip purpose, like of why, why they're traveling, but you, you know they're traveling with another person. So you could just copy the trip purpose over from another person. And here's some SQL code um, I feel like I'm not too picky on like what type of code you're going to write this in as long as you're doing it, but this particular one is SQL. And then here's an example of a scripting something where uh, I wrote a function to calculate margins of errors because I kept needing to do this over and over again. And when I initially wrote this function, I made it like super long and complicated and had tried to make it do everything to be really flexible and it was not useful for people. So I ended up having to rewrite that. That's just kind of like a general thing about, you know, you're going to need to refactor your code to make it more useful and keeping your functions nice and short and understandable, hopefully. Like it's kind of like the don't make it too fancy thing. And then put your code on GitHub. If you're on my team and you're listening right now, did you put your code on GitHub? <laughs> I can't tell if anyone's laughing, but you know what? I bet you are, but I bet you're laughing. <laughs> did you, you need to check it in right now. Okay, so once you have it coded, because that's the first step, you got to communicate what you did. So you need to document how your workflow works. You need to show it to another person. And, you, and hopefully you have your data in a shared location as well. So we like to document our, um, our workflows on our data wiki. Uh, we recently switched to media wiki. Um, basically, I think what's nice about having an internal wiki is like you can, you can be pretty messy about it. You want to make the bar low so that people just do the thing because you know that documenting is not fun but you need to get it done right and then we store our travel survey data in a central data warehouse which we call elmer again the cutesy names this one's the glue it keeps everything together um and so one thing to keep in mind here was it's important to script the etl extract transform load into the database and out of it you're going to need to repeat that process of getting the data in and out and you might want to, you might be tempted to manually do it, but it's important because you're going to, it's, it's, you know, you're going to have to do it again. We also like to use views with travel survey data because it has a natural kind of like joining thing that you, so it's naturally joined like trips are joined to people, people are joined to households. And so it's nice to have that kind of all joined together. And then after you have done your coding and you're communicating, uh, testing. So having people test your code to make sure that someone understands it and can use it. Have people test your documentation to understand they can follow it. And then as with testing, keeping doing checks, check totals throughout the data and at the end. And then at the end, of course, you need people to check your data products. Like I still need this hugely, like from multiple people because there's just so many things that are not easy to understand. So kind of like a final thought on this is, I feel like we have this super cool app that I'm pretty proud of that lets us get data out to planners. And I think the real key thing to making this app successful was the collaboration that I had. So the, on the left, there's um, 
the main app developer, Christy Lamb. And she's like, she has like more of a data engineering kind of background app development. And I'm more into like the statistics data science work. And so there, there was like a lot of back and forth about understanding different concepts that we were giving to each other, but then also it, it, it forces you to write better code and forces you to write better documentation when you work with someone else because they have to reuse what you did. And if you, and if you just did something in a kind of crazy way that you can use one time that's not documented, then it's it's just not a good idea. So you can kind of see on the on the right the like GitHub check-ins where you kind of see sometimes we were working together at the same time. And so I just um I wrote down a bunch of tools that I like for good workflow if people are just looking for some tools that they're not sure where to start. And I just like to use a variety of different tools depending on whatever I'm doing. Um, and also like this is such a constantly evolving thing, you know, like lately we just can't, you can't just stick with one tool. It's just not going to work. You're not going to, you're not going to be effective for planning if you just decide you just like this one thing. So, you know, I was trying to think of like all the different programming languages that I've learned over the years and forgotten and <laughs> it's a lot. And so I think it's just, it's rolling with that finding the good ways to keep learning is really important. Um, I showed you a bunch of different things that we did. And so here are the links to that for future reference. And that's it. Thank you. Um, that was great. Could you put those links back up for one quick second? They disappeared really quickly. Okay. Yeah, I saw somebody had asked for the link to um, something about data cleaning. So I don't know, that might be included with what you were sharing. Yeah, it's on there somewhere. Okay. That one actually was a little bit of a problem because we had it in a private repository. So, and then I just pushed it up publicly. All right. Thank you. Um, there were, and I don't know if you saw anything that I missed. Um, there were questions about what tools and languages you use, but I think you kind of answered that in the next slide that you had there. Um, so I was just going to ask, since you uh, are passionate about committing to Git, um, for those who do know a little bit about version control or who are maybe hopefully about to learn more about it, um, what's your sweet spot for like frequency of commits of, or of, um, mm. yeah, what's what would you say about that? That's a really good, good question. So I feel like as soon as you have anything at all committed, don't wait. Like, I feel like people have this tendency to wait till they think something is good, like good and they're not embarrassed about it. Like you need to get over that like shame or whatever you need to just, as soon as you have something that sort of works. So I don't know what that means, like an hour or something in or something. And then, and then like to me i don't have like a like i'm not like super like you commit every day or something it's like i feel like when i get a chunk of something done so it's the quality and quantity i guess yeah i think so yeah but it but don't worry too much about the quality just just get it there yeah and to, for those who don't use version control as much, um, committing is basically just like checking in your your code. So it's almost like saving a document, but you're saving it and storing it so that if you ever, um, well, yeah, it's like saving. I don't I don't know if a good way to describe it. Um, and then when you you can push things up, you can commit a bunch of times and save your document or whatever it is a bunch, and then push it up to the um, origin repository where everybody else can have access to it. So some really, really quick intro to version control there. Um, all right, we are at 15 minutes, which is great timing, Suzanne. Um, so unless there are burning clarification questions, um, I think we can move on. And we can certainly talk more about the um, inner workings and what what Git and what version control does um, afterwards in the discussion, especially if there's interest or um, desire to learn more. Um, 
So um, next up is Dr. Ann Barris. Um, and Dr. Ann Barris obtained a bachelor, master, and PhD in computer science at the University of Kaiserslautern, Germany, and then completed postdoc appointments at Los Alamos National Laboratory and Oak Ridge National Laboratory before taking a position as a research scientist in the Computational Sciences Group at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Ann's research focuses on data science and visualization for urban data, including transportation, buildings, population dynamics, and urban microclimate. So Anne, excited to hear from you. Thank you, Leah. All right, so uh, I'm gonna start by telling you a little bit about one of the projects I'm on. So we're building a digital twin for traffic at regional scale for one of those projects. So to give you a quick overview, so the project is sponsored by the US Department of Energy Vehicle Technologies Office, and it's run by two national labs, one of them being Oak Ridge and the other one being the National Renewable Energy Lab. And then we have a bunch of project partners. First of all, the Chattanooga Department of Transportation, Chattanooga is the city where we do this work, two state Department of Transportation uh, and multiple industry partners. The, when we say digital twin, it's kind of a buzzword right now. So what we might mean by it is really three components. First of all, situational awareness. So that gives us observability to figure out what's actually happening right now, what was happening yesterday, what was happening a week ago. Um, the second component is simulation and modeling and machine learning. So that helps us figure out where issues are, try out new things without actually having to do them in the field immediately. So it's a great way of prototyping and demonstrating things are possible. And then last but not least, uh, we have cyber physical control. So that's where we actually change things in the living system. And the overarching goal for the project is to reduce energy use from transportation by 20% because it's a Department of Energy project. They want to know about energy, so we do too. Uh, although there are other interesting things to look at. So a little bit about Chattanooga. Chattanooga is uh, in the southeast of the US. It's right on the border between Tennessee and Georgia. Part of Chattanooga is actually in Georgia, although the majority is in Tennessee. Uh, the population is a little under 200,000. Um, and the reasons we chose the city is that, first of all, it's a very well-connected, smart city. They're really open to trying new things. They have a lot of sensors. Uh, and new technologies and fiber optic everywhere. Really nice to have. I wish we had that here. Um, the other reason is that it's a nexus for freight movement because it's right on the way between the southeast, specifically Florida and Georgia, and everywhere else. So a lot of freight traffic moves through this area. We have a ton of data sources. There's just a quick slide to say, look, we have a lot of data, but I don't really want to go into detail. Uh, I'll show you some specific ones. So we have these stationary radar detectors that are placed along the highways in all of uh, all four of the Tennessee metropolitan areas. And they collect uh, data at lane level at 30 second intervals. So they count how many vehicles came, came through and how fast was the average speed. So we get that for uh, 214 locations in the Chattanooga area alone, plus some in other places. And here you can see this is I-24 coming in from the west, snaking through here, this is a junction, uh, and that goes up to Nashville and then further north from there. Here we have I-75, which goes up through Knoxville and then into Kentucky, and then it goes south towards Atlanta, and then further down towards Florida. Um, so that's a lot of sensor locations to start with. Um, there are over 300 traffic, uh, traffic signals in Chattanooga. They have different controller versions, but if it, if it matters to you, they generally use NTCIP for communication. Um, and then for some of the traffic lights, we also have grid smart cameras. So there's 71 of those right now in the city, and they collect vehicle level information of when did a vehicle come through, how long was it, how fast was it going, where did it come from, where did it go to, um, how long did it have to wait for a green, um, some caveats on that, not going into the details here. Um, then here are some examples. So this is what our tool looks like. Uh, we have a map view here. I don't know if you can see my mouse, but that's on the left hand side. And then uh, depending on zoom level, we have different levels of detail for the same data. So for this slide, the data is based on those stationary radar sensors that I showed you. Um, 
And this one here is an example of what we do with the uh, grid smart data. So this visualization shows turn movements between different directions on the intersection. Um, again, not going into detail right now, but if anyone wants to hear more about it, I'm happy to tell you more. Um, then here's a third one. This is for incident data. Uh, so we made a nested visualization. Uh, it's called a sunburst diagram. Um, that visualizes different aspects that might have contributed to an incident. So we have the temp day, we have what type of incident was it, how severe was it, and then we have weather uh, during the incident. But what we're really here for is data workflows. So I've already told you we have a lot of data and from each data source we might have a lot of data points in space and then tons of points in time. So, but the data is not at all uniform. So some of the data is in real time. Some of the data uh, can be fetched automatically from a source, but uh, it might be historic data. Some of the data we get pushes from whoever's providing the data. So for one of the data sets, we get daily uploads on an FTP server. For another data source, we get daily emails with the most recent data. So that's a lot to wrangle. And then finally, there's manual data download where we have to log into a portal manually, manually select what we need, download it, and then we can integrate it. So that's a lot of different things that kind of have to work together into having one database that has everything. So we have a lot of data processing. As Suzanne said, automate everything. You don't want to do that manually ever, especially if you have data coming in every day, every week, every month, whatever. So that's parsing, it's both uh, temporal and spatial aggregation, it's some data fusion where we want to add a little bit more data, a um, bunch of analytics, and then we store it in the geodatabase in a format that is pretty close to what we need in the end. So when we access it, it's going to be fast. To get to that data, we have data services. Uh, those run as microservices, again, nice buzzword, but they're actually useful. Um, so the data services have two tasks. One of them is serving data from the database in specific formats. So basically we have a couple of different functions to get different aggregates, for example, for, for the same data or get it for one chart, but then also for another chart or for some other analytic, which might need a slightly different format. So the data service takes care of that. And it also gives us a way to access real-time data if it's behind a firewall, for example, so we can still access it without having to worry about that. And then those data services are used by a couple of different things. So first of all, we have our situational awareness tool, which needs it for different charts and analytics and all that. We need to display data, so we need to get the data into there. Um, on the bottom right, we have the traffic signal control module, which also needs some very specific data to determine what we're supposed to do with traffic lights. Um, that's not always running. So far we've done some experiments, but it's not fully in the field yet. Uh, and then the top right, uh, that's really where it's at. So this is individual team members' computers because we don't do our development on the live platform for the most part. So uh, all our prototyping and testing and a lot of the data analysis and research happens on our own computers. Um, and then, uh, and I left out a bunch of stuff on proxies and VPN tunnels and other fun stuff like that because I'm not, I'm not a DevOps person. I will not be able to tell you a whole lot about it, um, but there's more stuff in there. For development, we have 10 to 20 people or so who are doing some level of development, some purely in research, some purely on the DevOps side, but we all use different languages. We have different operating system. We definitely have Windows and Mac and Linux users on the team. So that has to work out. We have different software versions or library versions. Um, so I might use Python and my colleague might, eat, might use Python, but maybe I'm on 3.5 and they're on 3.4 or whatever, or even worse, 2.7. Um, but yeah, so, um, so even within a single language that we might share, we may still have differences. But then we also use it a lot of different languages. So I mainly use Python. Some of my colleagues mainly use R. And then the web app is developed in Java. Visualizations are in JavaScript. And even within JavaScript, it's not all the same library. So we have some WebGL, we have D3, we have PyCharts. So there's a lot going on there. 
So for research code, a lot of development happens in Jupyter Notebooks or R Notebooks. And for the, for the JavaScript side of things, we have a lot of standalone mini apps before we integrate them into the big app because that's a lot of work. So it's just a quicker turnaround for testing until we're ready to move it towards production. And then for production ready code, we don't use notebooks, we use pure Python. So that has to be ported and we try to develop it in the notebooks in a way that makes it easy to port. Um, but yeah, so that's slightly different, but still somewhat similar. Um, but yeah, so we have a fairly big team. We have all these different development ecosystems. So how does Git help us with that? First of all, for development, obviously, emergency backup, um, you don't want to lose your work. Um, it has feature branches as an option. So if you have a bigger team working together, uh, it really helps if I want to add that one new turn, I can have that in a new feature branch. So if someone else is also working on something, they don't have a not fully working chart in their interface yet, for example. Um, and then if you have something like a production system or a staging system where you do testing, being able to tag specific commits as this is what's on the production server is very useful. So if anything happens on the production server and I want to see on my computer, can I reproduce that issue? I need to know which of the many, many commits on there I should be testing for. So that's where the tagging is really helpful. Then obviously code sharing, uh, it's one centralized location. Everybody knows where to look. So it's not a matter of, hey, can you zip up the most recent version of your code and don't do that. Um, it also has really nice display for notebooks um, with some caveats, but I just learned uh, during a prep session for this panel that there's actually JupyterText, uh, which helps turn the notebooks into a format where if you do a diff, of the version from yesterday and the version of today, you actually get something meaningful, not a bunch of JSON in between. Um, and it's also really nice to be able to share the soft, like a, a level of software version control. So for Jupyter, for example, or Conda, you can create environment files, which basically store the exact Python version that you're using and the exact version of every library that you're using. And then you can install the same environment on a different computer uh, with a single command and then it should just work. So that's very convenient. So you can just store, hey, this is the environment that you should be using for this code. And then you don't have to worry about people maybe using a different version. Documentation is great because GitLab and GitHub come with wiki pages. So you can do, put the documentation right where the code is. There are also the readme.md files, which are great. So they're just rendered if you look at the website uh, for any folder that you put one in. Now we also use it a lot for communication because it has an issue tracker or for bigger projects I've used merge requests uh, for a lot of communication in the past when I was developing a feature but I needed feedback from other people um, or they were doing code review and then we were able to iterate using the issue tracker so that was very useful. Um, that, so I mentioned GitLab, uh, it's kind of like GitHub but you can install it in your own infrastructure. So if you're at an institution like a national lab and maybe you don't want your code or your data out there in the open, uh, you want to have a little bit more control, you can install it on your own infrastructure and you control everything. And if you use the enterprise version, you can also integrate your institutional login. I don't know if that works for the free version, but there is a free version. Downside is if you install it, you maintain it, so you're responsible for keeping it running. But if you have an IT department, you don't have to worry about it. So I'm not too concerned with that myself. Um, the feature set is pretty similar to GitHub, but not quite the same. Um, I have at least one example where they're different. Um, but yeah, so here are some cool features that maybe if you've just used GitHub command line, you might not have seen yet. So both GitHub and GitLab have Kanban board features. Uh, which are, if you don't know what a Kanban board is, basically just columns of to do in progress and done. You can drag your tasks from one to the other. So it's kind of like the virtual version of sticky notes. Um, it's not as powerful and elaborate as say Jira or Trello, but if you have a small project, uh, it's pretty convenient to have that right where the code is and not have to go somewhere else. For a big project, we use Jira. We don't use the, the GitLab version of it, but it's pretty nice to have. Then the issue tracker is great, not just to track features or bugs, 
but also you can have people comment on results. You can write about interim results, write about your progress because you have good commit messages, but you can't usually, you can't add pictures to commit messages, for example. So if you want, if you do visualization, for example, it's nice to be able to just post a screenshot in there and say, hey, look, this is what it looks like right now and this is what I still need to do. So it gives you a visual. And then finally, something that's particularly cool for GitLab, they unfortunately don't have it for GitHub, is Mermaids, which is um, a tool that lets you define charts like the ones down here using Markdown. So all of that is generated using Markdown. And if you use that for one or two projects, it's pretty nice to have uh, to add that to your documentation. Finally, I want to share two resources. First of all, gitimmersion.com is great for uh, as a tutorial. It starts at a very low basic level. So like, what is a commit? What is a post? How do you do, how do, you do all that? So if you're new to Git, it's a great place to start. But also, if you're a seasoned Git user, there are still so many things to learn. Like I've been using Git for years. There are still a lot of things I don't know, a lot of things I haven't used. And uh, Git Immersion really goes over everything I've come up with that was like, all right, I want to learn how to do X. Git Immersion was able to do that. Also, sometimes things go wrong when you use Git and you have those oh shit moments. And oh shit, git.com addresses that. So basically it's, oh shit, I accidentally did X. And then gives you a solution. And one quick spoiler alert, never push when you just messed up. It's a lot easier to fix if you haven't pushed yet. Um, that's just a general rule. But yeah, so with that, um, thank you to everyone on the project and our sponsor and our partners. And um, if you want to send me emails, you can. Uh, this is my email. It's barrisas at rml.gov. Um, but also we have a panel session after, so we'll give time for questions. Thank you. Um, did it looked like there was a question more specifically about your work, which I'm going to let you answer in the chat. But um, in the uh, in um, the couple of minutes we have, um, and thank you for being on time, I wanted to ask back, you had this vast um, kind of network of data sources, including it sounds like some manual downloads. So as you're in your data processing step, are there times when you need manual intervention? And how do you balance like manual data cleaning or unexpected things that come up in data processing versus automating everything? Um, so for the most part, our data is somewhat well behaved because most of us most of it is collected automatically. So it's not like the National House of Travel Survey where people have free text and put in something that doesn't make sense. So it's, most of it is collected by sensors, so most of it makes sense. However, uh, we, we can still run into issues. So sometimes the sensors malfunction or they start just going bad and just need a reset. Like sometimes you have to restart your computer to make it work. Same thing with sensors. So we have seen some anomalies in there. So that we're actually working on uh, having some level of anomaly detection to tag when things look suspicious because I don't think 100 miles per hour on a small city road is reasonable, especially when it's a, a road that has a lot of densely packed traffic lights. Um, so that that's definitely something where like even though the data is technically well behaved that's still an issue but manual processing we don't actually have to do that much so usually manual processing is just a more of a data discovery method for us before we put it into scripts nice. but even like exploration i usually do in pandas if it's script everything tabular data at least. yeah um, that's I like the term anomaly detection because even though it's kind of a buzzword, it actually, the term for it describes what it does. You detect anomalies, so that's um, a great, great thing to point out. Um, all right, uh, if and and I think you have some questions in the chat if you want to go and um, respond to those. But next up, we'll go to our next speaker, who is Billy Charlton. Um, 
Billy Charlton is a research scientist at the Technical University of Berlin, where his focus is on data visualization for agent-based transport simulations. Before arriving in Berlin, Billy received bachelor's and master's degrees in civil engineering from Cornell and Northwestern universities. He spent many years in San Francisco at the SFCTA and Seattle at the PSRC, um, where Suzanne works, leading their data modeling teams. He's also a founding instigator of Zephyr. So Billy, take it away. Thank you very much. Um, I am going to share my screen. Do, do, do. Let's see if this works. Hopefully it will. All righty. Uh, can you see my screen? I bet you can. Um, good evening. Uh, I'm actually in Berlin, uh, so you're not getting me at my best this evening uh, because I have been talking all day long and I'm actually about to lose my voice. So I apologize um, and I'm hoping that uh, uh, we can get through this without any trouble. Luckily, it's only 15 minutes, so I think we'll be fine. Uh, hello. Um, I want to talk about a couple different things we've been doing here. Uh, but before I begin, I just want to basically agree with everything that Anne and uh, Suzanne have already said in terms of the, the, the Git, um, the saving everything, publishing everything, sharing everything. Uh, it is so much easier to do science when things are out in the open. Uh, I can't tell you how much it's changed my workflow once I was able to get things outside of the firewall in the different places I've been working. So yes to everything that you both said, thank you. Um, so my presentation is basically done now, thanks. Um, but since I have a few more minutes, let me skip to the very end of my presentation, boom, and just go to the, just the end, which is just remember this one thing. It is. It is so easy now and completely free to put your results, your dashboards, whichever tool you're using, whatever technology you have, it's so easy to put them online now. Um, just do it. Get your stuff online and get either your stakeholders or even just your team involved uh, in talking about the results. So I'm gonna talk a little bit today as quickly as I can about how we actually do that. All right. so. Back to the beginning, boom, 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 boom. Okay, so uh, overview, just like uh, Suzanne said, automate everything. And to review, let's automate everything. R really, please just automate everything you possibly can. Um, here's where we were in my, uh, in my university on our team in Berlin. We were building this big web-based data analysis platform and it had a front end and a back end and we had six different servers in the back copying files people were moving things around uh, lots of front end code it was a mess it was hard to manage and i was really the only one on the whole team who had like the whole thing in my in my head we had all these different requirements um, we had different personas of the different types of people that were going to be using it um, and then March of 2020 happened. So where were you in March of 2020? Uh, I'll tell you where I was. I was skiing uh, on a work trip. We had a seminar talking uh, about uh, all of our different research topics for the different PhD, group, PhD groups. Um, I don't know if you've heard of the town of Ischgl, uh, but our hotel was right outside of Ischgl, uh, which this spring and summer was in the news all over Europe for being the place where everyone got coronavirus and spread it to the rest of Europe. And I was one of those people in March, and I was in quarantine for 20 days. I did, was sick for a few days, but then I recovered, thankfully. But what this did was it got our team really thinking about the work we were doing. And so uh, Matson is this uh, agent-based transport platform uh, that is uh, used all over the world. As you can see, this is the Matson website. So we already have this model that has, you know, it's agent based, so it knows exactly where everybody is all the time. So the head of our team, Professor Kai Nagel, was like, well, how hard would it be to add some virus propagation semantics and modules to this, to this tool? And so that is exactly what we've done. Uh, and this all happened really, really quickly in March. And we decided we needed to make a data portal because we didn't want this stuff just to be inside our group, but we wanted to be able to share it. So that's the three minutes of what we did and why we did it. So remember I showed you we were building this thing. I was like, if we need to get this thing up in the next couple of weeks, 
uh, we can't do any of that stuff. <laughs> we just need to build a web client really quickly and do nothing else. So we already had a file server set up um, and all we had to do was do the, the, the front end code. So the other people on my team are not website developers. They don't know JavaScript. They're modelers just like you and me. Um, and uh, what we did was we produced a system where the all of the configuration for the model runs was done in configuration files like this one here. Uh, so we have a file server on our, on our network and every time they run a version of this new EpiSim model, uh, they're dumping the files into that file server. And in addition to the outputs from the model, they put in this little configuration file that says, these are the different parameters that we used um, for the model. Uh, and now I'm gonna flip to site itself and so here is the website I hope someone else is admitting these people sorry people um, and then for each of these different model runs we now have a little dashboard now this dashboard happens to be written in JavaScript but I'm not recommending that people on this call learn JavaScript I don't care what platform you use it can be shiny it can be Python but the point is we were very rapidly able to build this website and get it online. Uh, and it has all sorts of information about um, uh, different scenarios. And uh, in this particular case, we were looking at different types of restrictions on uh, you know, whether or not people are wearing masks in school, if there's a curfew at night, and each one of these different combinations is like a different set of runs. And so all worked really great. Okay, so, so how on earth did we do that? Uh, and so this is the part that I really, I really want to drive home, which is that, uh, as I mentioned, we already had a file server that has all of the scenarios. So like I can look in the file server in the Germany folder, there's a Berlin folder, and then there's different projects, and then we have all these different outputs um, sort of stored in the file server itself. Uh, and what the code does is it just references those files and sorry, wrong link, and then uh, builds the UI from that. This was so successful that we decided to do the same thing for uh, another project um, called, and this is just like a generic output visualizer. So we said, okay, let's look at again. Oh, so this might run slowly because we are viewing things on, Online, so Berlin projects. Let's try the Pave project. Yeah, and so just lots of different visualizations, basically different dashboards uh, of the model outputs. And so this one is a visualization of different um, things running around in Berlin. These are uh, basically shared taxis. It's a DRT example, so dynamic rapid transit. Um, this one's in German. Not super interesting. Okay. Uh, since that's taking a while to load, because I'm also sharing my screen, I'll come back to that because I only have a few minutes. Um, but the idea here is that, uh, come back. Sorry about that. There we go. Is that we built these different websites uh, that you can see these different guys going on. Okay, so now you can see it. Um, so fancy stuff, but you're not here to see our fancy pictures. I want to show you how we did this. So Suzanne was describing GitHub and how she puts everything on GitHub. Um, do you know how easy it is to also publish websites on GitHub? You might've thought that GitHub was only for sharing code. You can also create websites. Uh, GitHub has something called GitHub pages. And so I'm gonna go to my GitHub page here and I'm gonna create a re new repository, Zephyr demo, it's public. Uh, we'll add a readme file. I'm going to click create repository. And in five seconds, we've created this Zephyr demo repository. This is basically just a vessel for whatever content you want to put in it. Um, say this is model results. Data to come. Boom. I'm going to save that file. And so I now have one simple little text file on this repository. 
I can go to settings for this repository and down all the way at the bottom is this thing called GitHub Pages. GitHub Pages is designed to host your personal organizational or project pages from a GitHub repository. That sounds great. Say I want to serve my main branch, which is where all the main files are. Let's pick a cute theme. I don't know. Let's go with minimal. Select theme. That's fine. Uh, and I think, got it. Boom. Welcome to GitHub Pages. And I think that should be done now. Does it say? Yeah, your site is ready to be published at. And so here's a link to the website that I just built. I mean, literally that took 30 seconds. Um, so it actually takes about two minutes or so for GitHub to actually go through all of the plumbing behind it uh, to actually build this website. So I'll come back to this in a moment. Um, but the, the, the point here is that in, with almost zero effort, I was able to create a site online, uh, which I can now drop all of my outputs on. Onto. So this is exactly what we did for uh, that, COVID, uh, that COVID site where we said we built a GitHub page and I built a front end, but you know, Christy at PSRC might have built a shiny front end or something else. And then with all the files there, it just builds it for you. It's kind of amazing. Um, all right, what else can I show you in the time that I have? It looks like I have three minutes left. Um, I wanted to show you uh, so this is the file server again. Um, this is uh, the file. So this is the, the outputs from our zip file. I can look at this metadata file and you'll see uh, the different pieces uh, for this particular model run. Um, and whatever is in that file is exactly what comes uh, into the website itself. Um, and this was really key, uh, as I said, because the other people on the team weren't developers, they are modelers. And what we were trying to do is we were trying to shorten the distance between my model having finished running and us having actual uh, data up on the web published. And so that's, that's how we did that. Um, I think I have a couple more minutes. Let's see if I can flip to one other thing. Oh, um, I mentioned that uh, we have a file server. We are using something called Subversion. So those of us, those of you who are already using Git for all your file storage may be surprised to hear this, but I think a lot of people haven't heard of this. Subversion is an old technology uh, that was around way before Git was. Um, and Git has taken the world by storm uh, for lots of really good reasons. Git is uh, really great for sharing code, but Subversion is really great for storing and sharing big files. And our model runs, uh, being agent-based, are literally you know, hundreds of megabytes, sometimes gigabytes of data. And uh, Git is really poorly set up to, to manage large files. And so our file server is actually uh, on something called Subversion. Uh, if you don't have a file server like this, if you are just working on your own desktop you know, uh, you know, in your office and you don't have IT support to do something like that, uh, we also made it so that our system, at least, uh, can handle just local files on your C drive. Uh, so uh, there's like a three-line Python command that just serves anything in this Billy slash data folder. So that's now running locally on my machine. And if I go to uh, the second site I showed you, aftersim.github.io, and I say, I want to look at my local files. Oh my gosh, that's supposed to work. Come on. Oh boy. All right. So uh, the demo gods are with us today. Uh, normally that would show me the files that are here. I don't know why they're not, but I think I'm out of time anyway. So let's just stop there and um, open the floor for questions from everyone else. That was about the fastest I've ever done that presentation. Normally I take about 45 minutes to do that. So I'm really sorry if I went too fast, but I, I wanted to be mindful of everybody's time. So thank you. Um, that was like, we can, if you get something working while we're in the discussion, feel free to pop your screen back up. Um, sure. But yeah, um, I think there, there was a specific question for you in the chat. So please visit that after. Um, I have a kind of, 
general question, um, given that if you're working with um, data about this virus and probably having to respond maybe to all of the like different information that's coming out about the virus every day, um, how do you balance like the just the new um, ways it can spread or, or new information about ways it can spread and whatever, how do you balance that with having a production ready tool? Um, you're just constantly maintaining your workflow, it seems like. Right, well, uh, so um, the, the way this works is that our, our department, the work on the COVID is funded by the, the German Federal Department of Education because they wanted our input on how and when to reopen schools. And so what they basically wanted us to do was give them a report every two weeks answering the hot questions of the day, uh, either from them or from the, or you know, from out in the media. And so the site that I just showed you uh, actually has uh, all these different versions of the model. Um, if I can share my screen just for one more second, I can show you uh, that this guy here, you'll, I didn't scroll very far down. Oh, my timer's going off. Um, but we have visualizations, we have calculators, and then here are all these different published reports with summaries in English, but mostly in German, describing ever since April, our best um, understanding of what's happening with the virus. And the model results, we actually keep every single version that we've run here. So that dashboard that I just showed you, we actually have about 20 or 30 of them now. Uh, and each one of these different dashboards is just a different subfolder in that file server that I showed you. And the URL in the browser is pointing to the name of the folder on the file server. And so it was just a big data organization challenge, I guess, uh, and that's how we solved it. So lots of different versions. Nice. Yeah, I like that um, storing how things looked at each point in time so that you can compare and see if, I don't know, if things look better yeah. or worse with <laughs> the new information. Right. Um, all right. Um, Thank you to all three of our speakers. Um, we can, we're kind of, it's, it's great. We're right with 30 minutes left. We can move into the discussion portion. Um, so I will, I, there's already some, a little bit of discussion in the chat. So speakers are welcome to respond there. Um, and if I think there is like a hand raising feature. So if people do want to verbalize a question, um, feel free to raise your hands. Um, and if each, speaker as well as Elizabeth can keep an eye on the chat and um, butt in with any hot topics or anything that we want to discuss um, in person or verbally, that's great. I can try to um, kick it off with a question to all three panelists. Um, so we talk a lot about workflow and I think a lot of what you were, or obviously the session is about workflow, a lot of what you were talking about are things that um, you're doing over and over again. And so obviously you would want some kind of automated, highly rep repeatable workflow. Um, how do you balance, how do you figure out when something needs that kind of treatment? So is it like if you do something more than once, if you're doing something more than five times, I don't know, it's kind of a basic question, but at what point are you doing a data task and you go, oh gosh, I need to incorporate this into my workflow or build a new workflow or what have you? Um, if I can start, so I really try to just automate it immediately because in all likelihood I will need it again. Like I rarely look at data that I will never need again because why would I look at it in the first place unless it's just like, oh, do I want to use data source A or data source B for a specific task? But most of the time I will have to evaluate both a little bit more. Maybe I want to compare them. And then guess what? I need to get them in the same format. So I'm already halfway through doing all the reformatting. And uh, I would just recommend find a library you're comfortable with and stick with it and learn it really well. And it doesn't matter which one it is. I like pandas. I'm sure there are other great libraries out there. Um, but then you get, you get to know those functions and you actually get pretty quick at making specific changes. Suzanne or Billy, do you have anything you would add there? 
I'm actually having connection problems. Maybe Suzanne can go first. Uh, hopefully it'll get better. Um, I'm also having a little bit of connection problems. I could sort of hear what you're saying. Um, yeah, I think I have to agree with Anne. It's like, as soon as you're doing something, I feel like the only reason that I don't build the workflow is because I'm being lazy. Like, honestly, like, I, or, oh, I get too excited about an idea. And so I'm just like, I have to find out what is really happening. Like, I get really excited. And so then I don't build a good workflow. I don't know. That's, I feel like it's just, I don't know. Um, I don't know if, if Billy's back. Yeah. I'm trying. Uh, okay. I mean, so so I, I left out a lot of the, the, the really frustrating journey from where we were to where, how we got this platform. Um, and what happened was that our workflow wasn't really working for us. And so we did realize at some point uh, that it was taking too long. And in particular, we had a couple of people who were bottlenecks to everything we were doing. And it wasn't their fault. The problem was that they had too much to do because they weren't automating enough things. Uh, and so we sort of had a full stop when the corona crisis happened and we said, we need to just rethink how we're doing this. Um, and it's really hard to let go of two years worth of work, but that's literally what we did. We had all this stuff and we said, you know, let's call this a learning experience and let's write a paper about it. Uh, and declare victory <laughs> and move on. So that's really what we did. Nice. Um, okay, if anyone distills the chat and wants to pop in with something, it looks like there are some really good questions there. Um, I, I guess one, following up on what Suzanne says, how do you motivate yourself to get past the laziness of not wanting to script something? <laughs> Or I, you, maybe you're still scripting it, not wanting to um, fully automate something that really needs to be um, repeatable Suzanne, or reproducible. You, you love this stuff. I don't believe that Suzanne doesn't like doing that. Yeah, that she might be second. speaking for <laughs> speaking for others. Like you need to do, you need to do it. But I don't know if I love this. <laughs> oh, I really do. I think you do too. Uh, to me, these things are like a little puzzle and figuring out how the pieces fit together is really part of the challenge. It's to me. Okay, it's okay. Maybe it's um, the motivating other people part that I don't like, and that's a lot <laughs> of my job. Um, I see a question right at the bottom yeah. of the chat. Can I, can I just answer it because I know yes, the answer? Yes, please. Uh, it says, uh, from Jeffrey Dumont says, can we talk about how continuous integration technology factors into our data workflows? Uh, so continuous integration uh, is uh, technology where uh, as soon as you make changes to the code or the data, there, that's sort of a trigger that then sets off some sort of process. So whether it, that, uh, as soon as you make the changes, some tests run or your model starts or your website updates, uh, we use continuous integration for everything that we do. Uh, the Matsim team itself, uh, whenever they make changes to the Matsim model, as soon as it's checked into GitHub, that sets off about 30 hours of, I don't know if it's 30, but uh, many, many, many hours of tests to make sure that the code uh, hasn't broken anything. A lot of times things break anyway. Uh, and also for our websites, anytime that we check something in, uh, the website is rebuilt automatically, and we have nightly builds to make sure that uh, things are always in a good state. Um, I don't know if Suzanne or Anne, if you are using CI, as it's called for you, but we use it everywhere. Yeah, I, the team I work with uses continuous in integration through Microsoft. So there are a couple, there's something called Jenkins that is, is not the Microsoft one that does continuous in integration. I think there's something called Travis. Um, we use the Microsoft Azure. So I'm throwing words out in case anybody is interested in looking into those tools. Um, it is, it's a very handy like validation, like you were saying. Yep, I'll drop a link in the chat as well. Uh, we use Travis, Travis CI, uh, and it really, really nicely integrates with GitHub. Basically, you sign up, you log into Travis, and you can use your GitHub login. And it says, which repositories do you want to turn on continuous integration? And you have to click a couple boxes. And then 
there's a little config file just like the one I showed you in text where you say, whenever there's a check-in, I want you to run this script or I want you to run those tests. Uh, it's, uh, you know, like anything, uh, the first time you use it, it's something new and you don't know what it is, but it very quickly uh, um, becomes just a part of your daily workflow. And uh, I love it. And there are many of those. I'll just chime in. This is Elizabeth. I'll show my face for a moment. Um, Hi, Elizabeth. <laughs> well, I don't know if I can show my face. Zoom's not letting me. Um, but, <laughs> but in terms of continuous integration, there's also, it's really easy now to do it in GitHub. There's a lot of really, you know, clickable integrations that you don't even have to, to mess with. The, some, previously, some of the configurations and setups for continuous integration were pretty frustrating to say the least um, that has been resolved in the latest versions of github um, and also you can use github actions and actually run things just on github itself and some of the things that that i like to do are things like if it passes the test then you can automatically build your documentation site and serve it back to github sites which um, so that your documentation is continuously updated with your code uh, and you know, but only if it passes the tests. And you can also uh, make sure that people don't commit to the master branch without passing the tests, because um, we all have problems with people wanting to commit their code and thinking it's all good and not bothering to run the tests and then leaving for the weekend. Um, you don't want that to happen to any live code. Uh, so uh, there's so much cool functionality you can do with continuous integration and uh, branch permissions. I'll disappear again. <laughs> Yeah, if your branch is not protected is when you need to go to that site that Anne mentioned, I think. Um. Right. <laughs> I had never heard of that one before, but I'm definitely... That's great. That. I will be using that. <laughs> oh, yeah, me too. Um, sure. I think Elizabeth mentioned another thing. So you, you all, I think, talked about collaboration within your teams or within your institutions or organizations. Um, what about collaborating with people, out, like consultants or um, clients, depending on where you are? Um, people who are not within your institution, do you, from start to finish, involve them in your workflow and developing it and whatnot, or kind of keep that separate, or how do you approach that? We really work, like so we have uh, a lot of collaborators at uh, National Renewable Energy Lab, and they use mostly the same workflow we do. Um, we did discuss how we want to go about it fairly early on and i mean for the gitlab we didn't really ask for buy-in we just said this is how we're going to do it because that's what uh, our institution requires us to use um but then other things like sharing data has been a struggle um i mean we have the database but if we want to share raw data there are all kinds of fun institutional hurdles you have to jump over um, with who owns what data, who can look at what data. We have some data only we can use, uh, and they have some data only they can use, so we can't put that on a shared platform. And then we can only use Dropbox. They can only use Box.com. So we use SharePoint, which is the worst of all worlds. Um, <laughs> and like, it's, it's just not a suitable place to put big files. Like, I mean, SharePoint is great for some use cases. It is not great for what we're trying to use it for, but it was the greatest common denominator, I guess, for what we were permitted to use. That's a compromise. How about Either. Everyone? Yeah. <laughs> uh, Suzanne, you want to go? Um, yeah, I, I would just say, like, it's funny that you're asking this, Leah, because, like, we work with you at RSG on collaborating, and it is difficult. Um, we have our separate workflows, we hand files back and forth via the FTP site, and they have problems. We want to put everything public, you want to keep it private. Um, I don't think, can you just put it, let's make it public. It's just, <laughs> so I, I don't actually know the good solutions on that. So I would love to hear if someone has good solutions on collaborating across public and private uh, infrastructure. It's probably something about setting it up up front, saying exactly what you want when you write the contract. I don't know. Right. I think the contract stuff is probably really important. 
Um, we, of course, have both. Uh, the COVID work is all completely public and online, but that's actually the exception, not the rule. Uh, the files that we have uh, that are all on that file server, uh, we have really strict instructions on what can be placed there and what can't. And we have a secret second file server, uh, which requires a login. Uh, and our web browser, uh, that tool actually um, has some permissions you can log in as yourself and then have access to it. So we do a lot of work, uh, like with Volkswagen, for example, on some of the shared taxi fleet management type stuff. Uh, and they don't want any of this stuff public. So we have built some things that uh, are private because of that. And some things are in between. Um, my gosh, I mean, every collaboration is different. You know, uh, and when I was at the public agencies, we dealt with this every day. I don't know if there's a one size fits all answer to this. Yeah. And there's a, I would say there's um, data is the kind of thing you probably want to keep your data private, but I th we're talking about like the code and the workflows and stuff, which doesn't contain any personal information. So yeah, there probably is an argument to be had about whether some of that needs to be kept under wraps or what can be transparent and um, open for use. I th the whole open, um, open data science movement is definitely a big one. And when you're sharing things more publicly, I think it's a motivation to make your code work really nicely and look really nice and be well documented. So that's maybe another um, <laughs> argument for making things more open. So I'm certainly yeah, not in. Yeah. Get more of your code up there. <laughs> I, can do this publicly. I, I would love to have more stuff visible on my on my Git account, but um, alas. Um, is it, do, has anybody seen anything? We have about like a little under 15 minutes left. Um, is there anything popping up in the chat that people want to jump on um, or do? I haven't seen any hands raised. I'm not looking that closely, but um, do I'm people have anything we now. haven't? What's uh, that? I'm scrolling through it now. Okay. I didn't, while I was presenting, I didn't, I couldn't look at it. I, I just saw like this question from Ray. Um, do you guys at PSRC version control all codes and inputs? Well, I'm not doing modeling anymore and I saw Bryce was talking so he can he can say if something changed, but um, definitely the code um, as far as some of the inputs are in a geo database, the network files, some of it is not version controlled or it wasn't at least when I, I stopped. But we also, like I was talking about, we have the central database and so that it's, it's kind of a data warehouse for all our data that we're building out. And I guess you can call that version controlling data when you have a database in a way, but. Yeah, for us, uh, most of the data just comes in at regular intervals, but sometimes the format changes. Uh, so we don't necessarily version control the data, uh, but we do kind of have to version control the processing code um, and like for theoretically, I guess we could version control any analytic outcomes that we derive from the original data. But if you version control the code, you could just recompute the same output. So um, there is not really that much reason for us to actually do version control on the data itself. Um, but yeah, changes in data format are a huge pain to deal with. And um, I have spent many hours on doing that. Um, yeah, it's just something you have to deal with. And then like, I just try to document it well and just like, okay, this function deals with the following change that was made in how the data is delivered. So they, for example, for GridSmart, they recently switched from just storing, so they, they connect to the traffic light controller and they record when the traffic signal phase changes. And they used to just record it as a string of zeros and ones signaling green or red. Um, and it's just like 16 characters because there's 16 phases on the controller. And they just switched to using letters for red, yellow, and green instead. So that's going to require some changes. I mean, it's great because it gives us more information because now we don't just have red and green, we also have yellow, which is important information. Um, but it will require some changes and that that's not going to be compatible with the original code. So we, we have to come up with a solution for that. 
Um, I've one thing if some database tools interfacing tools will let you do a diff meet on the database schemas, which is a pain, but um, it'll allow you like a show differences between this database schema and this one. And you can see like, okay, column name person ID was dropped and column name per ID was added for if the database inexplicably <laughs> changes names. So that's one sort of data. Ver it's not record, but um, column wise and schema wise, um, it'll I tell you everything. Yeah, I remember spending a lot of time on this question uh, when I was at PSRC with Suzanne a couple of years ago where there's, you know, there's this Git system for versioning all of your files, but how do you version your data? And like, is there a Git for data? And I had seen a bunch of different startups, you know, show up and implode trying to solve this problem. Uh, I've seen plenty of blog entries from people saying, why would you want to do that? You know, it's like, <laughs> you know, my arm's like, hold on, hold on, like that. Uh, there doesn't seem to be an answer to this. That's sort of like a, you know, this question has been solved type thing. Um, yeah, yeah, so that's, Leanne, it's interesting that there's a, at least you can diff the schemas, like that's helpful, but the data itself, I think you're just supposed to keep adding new data and just make sure that it's time stamped and tagged correctly so you know what it relates to. And you just keep adding more data and you filter which data you're looking for. That's the best we've been able to come up with. There's no good answer though, I wish there was. Well, for databases, you can also use uh, migration uh, to do some level of version control. So we don't do that for our data tables, but we have parts of our user interface, uh, for example, that region map, uh, all those layers are managed to use in the database, uh, the traffic signals and their IP addresses and other sensors that we have to ping are managed in databases. And those databases we do use uh, the migration for. Um, I'm going to put a link in the chat after look up. Uh, I'm unfamiliar. Is my is migration the name of a specific tool? I, I'm no, that. um, that's the name of the process. I think it's called my betas, but I'm also that that is a DevOps task, and I'm not a DevOps person. I do use the workflow, so I've I've made some of those changes. Because okay. um, we okay. Yeah, I mean, you can use a database to like log every change that ever gets made and then the database can grow really big or you can um, You can write different checks into the database database to do it for you. I'm not a DevOps person either. I've kind of become one. I didn't mean to <laughs> um, uh, Yeah, we, we found that uh, our team was much more comfortable with files than they were with databases. Uh, but I think other teams are different, um, but that's where we, that's sort of where we were here. And so I had to meet the people on my team where they were, they weren't willing to move. Um, I'm actually one of those people too. I prefer files over databases. I kind of do too, but uh, hopefully Chris Peek, you're not still on the call. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, when it comes to workflows, I think if you're, if you have like, if your output is a data file and you're improving something, you do probably want to compare what was the old data output versus what is the new data output. Um, kind of like, um, Billy, you have all the previous model runs, results or whatever. Um, you want to see where your improvement was made and maybe um, track like, okay, we added this we, you, you were processing this a little bit better now, so we fixed these three broken records or whatever. Um, anyway, that that's one place where data version control might be useful. It seems like over an entire database, it gets tedious. Um, we have five minutes left. Um, I, I don't know if any of you three have something else you want to um, expand upon or if you are thinking of more things that might help the audience or that um, have been useful to you or that you want to learn from each other. Um, there is still some good discussion in the chat. People are sharing what other tools they use or practices they use. Um, so I welcome the audience to uh, read the chat and respond to that too. But yeah, in the last five minutes, do you all have any closing thoughts or um, I, I should probably be the one to summarize the takeaways, but what are your takeaways? Well, my takeaway would definitely be automate everything, put everything in Git, and commit 
So be, be generous with how often you commit rather than being stingy because you may lose important data. And, um, or not necessarily important data, but important code. Um, also, learn your tools to an extent where you're really comfortable. And it doesn't, it doesn't really matter which one you're most comfortable with. Um, it, it will depend on what kind of data you use. Like I use Pandas because I have a lot of tabular data and then I use JSON, just the, like the basic JSON library in, uh, in Python to deal with any JSON type files, including GeoJSON. Um, and that's been working really well for me. Uh, Pandas can be handled by some of the plotting libraries. So Pandas has some integrated plotting. If you haven't used it, it's pretty nifty if you just want to get like a quick overview of what's going on with your data. And then Seaborn, and I'm going to put a link in the chat for that, is a so far out of all the libraries I've seen the easiest to use library to get something going in very few lines of code. Because I'm lazy. I don't want to spend half my day on making one Matplotlib flow chart. I can spend 10 minutes on getting something nice in Seaborn instead. Um, what, there are so many data plotting libraries out there. It's, uh, um, it's an embarrassment of riches, uh, but it also means you have to pick one and stick to it. Uh, we love Seaborn in our group as well. Uh, we also found one called Vega and Vega Lite, uh, which is a JavaScript library, but that has patches to different languages. Um, which is really nice because, again, the, the non-programmer people could just make a config file that listed sort of here's which column has my x data, here's which column has my y data, make a scatter plot, and it just sort of does it for them automatically. Um, there's lots of them out there. Uh, our team is trying to learn uh, ggplot2 in R right now, uh, and that's going okay. There's so many of them, my gosh. Anything you would add, Suzanne? No, I don't think so. I was just adding a bunch of the stuff that people had asked me into the in the chat over there. You saw it. Um, yeah, why? Let's make a household travel survey data stand. That's not yeah. <laughs> Report, um, that great. I don't know if I have time for it, but can you do it? <laughs> <laughs> Somebody do it. Um, I like that idea. I, I would um, help. I would um, in the last two minutes, I so um, takeaways and mentioned automation, automate everything, repeatability, testing, continuous integration tools can help you test things or just get somebody else to run your same code and see if it works. It's another mm -hmm. simple way to test without using continuous integration. Um, if you're going to be working with different organizations, involve them early, put that in the contract, um, work with the other party to see what you want to do and what's going to be public or private and how you're going to share it. Um, keep learning new tools and getting comfortable with them, like Anne just said. And like Suzanne mentioned at the start, there is not really any data technology silver bullet um, using a lot of these things. Like maybe it's a combination of I don't know, R, Tableau, obviously um, version controls. There could be some uh, Conda or whatever to keep your environment stable. Um, there's, you wanna learn a variety of tools and put those together. And if, if there's a new, to new tool out there, you might wanna learn it. Um, so just keep learning and maybe we'll have more learning sessions to keep learning. Um, I don't think I have anything else to say, and we are about at time. So I just thank you so much to the three of you. I definitely learned some things and I've taken notes so that I can um, talk to my manager and my team after this and say, hey, can Me we too. use some of these things? Yeah, um, hopefully the audience feels this way as well. Uh, and please reach out to any of us by email if you wanna learn more. Um, that's all I have, unless Elizabeth or anybody from Zephyr has anything else. Thank nope. you all for your attention. This has been wonderful. And it's 9.30 p.m. I can finally have a beer. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> all right. Oh, by the way, Billy, to answer your what were you doing in March 2020 question, I was in the hospital giving birth in March 2020. Oh <laughs> so it's, I don't recommend um, giving birth when the pandemic starts. <laughs> <laughs>